Good afternoon to our listeners in Europe and good morning to those of you who are in North America. I am delighted to welcome you all to today's webinar on the future of globalization. I am Manos Matsaganis, professor at Polytechnic University of Milan and head of Greek and European Economy Observatory at the Hellenic Foundation for European and Foreign Policy, ELIAMEP, uh, which uh, organizes this seminar here in Athens, Greece. I will moderate today's webinar. Our panel today is both distinguished and gender balanced, unlike last time when we had only one male and as many as three female speakers. This time we got it right, I think. Our first speaker is Konstantin Mihalopoulos, Senior Advisor at ELIAMEP and formerly uh, a Chief Economist at USAID and an Economist at the World Bank. His latest book, Aid, Trade and Development, The Future of Globalization, published by Palgrave Macmillan, came out earlier this year. It's a wonderful book and those of you wishing to purchase it can do so at a reduced price. This is a commercial break courtesy of the author and the publishing house, Springer. Uh, so please write to me for details. Costas has also authored Policy Options for an Equitable Reglobalization, a policy paper that we published here at Eliamep, which I also urge you all to read. And it's available free of charge from our website. Next comes Antigoni Liberaki, who's a professor of economics at Pandion University in Athens. Uh, Antigone has done several wonderful things in her life, among which she was a co-founder of Action Aid Alas in the year 2000, and she was a general manager of uh, Solidarity Now, the uh, charity which done excellent work with refugees and others for the last five years. And she was also a member of parliament in the year 2015 and 2019. After Antigone, I will give the floor to Margarita Katsimi, who is my former colleague and a professor at Athens University of Economics and Business. Margarita has published extensively on a variety of topics, including international macroeconomics, political economy, and European integration. Her latest research is on firms exporting behavior. Our final speaker is Alessio Terzi, uh, who is an economist at the European Commission and a lecturer at Sciences Po at Lille. I'm delighted to welcome uh, Alessio back. Uh, in June, we held a webinar on the themes raised by, by his very interesting book, Growth for Good, Reshaping Capitalism to Save Humanity from the Climate Catastrophe. That book came out earlier this year by Harvard University Press. There is no need for me to remind listeners that this is a rather interesting moment for international relations, political and economic. Future historians may look back on this current year and remark on how the rise of China over the last three decades came to a head and also how Russia's invasion of Ukraine earlier this year turned out to be turning points, not just for geopolitics, but also for economic geography. Our panel members will address this and other questions. Has globalization peaked? Is it about to unravel? What future for international trade? Can multilateral cooperation help, help keep the world peace, cope with climate change and reduce global poverty? It's a tall order, but I'm sure our panelists uh, will do their best. So without further ado, I'm giving the floor to our first speaker, Kostas Michalopoulos. Kostas, over to you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm very pleased to be here today. And I want to thank Mano and uh, Jos Pavilatos and uh, the colleagues at uh, Eliamet for organizing the, uh, this uh, meeting, uh, which is actually uh, following the second edition of my book, uh, Aid, Trade and Development, The Future of Globalization. Uh, they had done the same thing five years ago, uh, uh, of the first edition. And since then, of course, uh, things have gotten very much worse in the global economy. The challenges of the world 
uh, faces that the real faces have multiplied. And uh, as uh, George uh, Pagulato recently said in the uh, the world is facing tough dilemmas at the time of monsters. Uh, the developing world is facing a lost decade uh, in growth and development, much like uh, it faced in 1970s. Uh, and what I want to do today is really say a few words about these challenges, and then we can discuss what needs to be done uh, to prevent uh, such outcome uh, for the developing countries and for poverty and uh, in general and in, at addressing poverty and uh, develop and promoting sustainable development um, at the turn of the 20th uh, 21st century the world was uh, in a position of uh, what i would say a remarkable uh, uh, and unparalleled international cooperation for development um, the millennium development goals were agreed and there was a lot of uh, international cooperation, both on aid and on trade. Uh, sadly, all this started to unravel uh, with the financial crisis of 2008. And uh, then came Trump and uh, the disastrous increase in protectionism, in uh, uh, deglobalization, and the growth of populism, uh, authoritarianism and uh, xenophobia. Um, this is where the new part of the book, uh, which uh, I will show you just to, to see that this is, this is what it looks like, uh, starts. Um, and as uh, the, if the Trump pandemic was not enough, a real pandemic happened in 2020. And uh, the world has never is not going to has not been uh, has, is not going to be the same ever since. Um, the global community was not making much progress in achieving the sustainable development goals that they had agreed at the United Nations in 2015, uh, and the pandemic uh, wreaked havoc on all of the prospects and targets for health, education, and poverty eradication. I had been agreed in 2015. We were starting to recover unevenly, but recover uh, when Putin invaded uh, Ukraine and things got worse. Uh, the book was at the printers when the Ukraine war started, and so it does not cover the effects of the invasion in detail. However, the basic uh, propositions of the book, I think, remain still valid. I think globalization, the conclusion that the book has is that globalization will continue in some form. Uh, but the key question is how equitable uh, and fair will this globalization be? Uh, let me just let me have a small technical aside. Uh, the traditional definition of globalization involves the share of merchandise trade in GDP, and this has been going down in recent years. Uh, and it will decline because, in fact, as incomes rise, uh, services become a larger portion of GDP, and services are less tradable than merchandise, and therefore you're going to expect the merchandise trade to be declining as, as a share of total GDP. Uh, but this is not the issue. The issue is policy and what the proper policies of the global community are going to be to promote both uh, sustainable development and an equitable form of economic development. Um, we have, I was just listening to the World Economic Outlook uh, Conference at the IMF this morning, and we have a number of very serious short-term problems inflation, an energy crisis, and possibly a recession in, in Europe in the near future, a food crisis in the low-income countries. And we have financial problems in the developing world. I mean, there are serious problems uh, of debt, of debt burdens, and rising, uh, and rising uh, uh, interest rates, uh, but as a consequence of the increase in the, in the value of the dollar. Uh, all this continues to be in the news, and uh, we can talk about it, but I would really like to uh, focus our discussion not on the near term, but on the longer term issues of, um, first of all, 
climate change, and secondly, what I call making globalization more equitable, re-globalizing re equitably. I have five proposed uh, uh, measures or a set of issues that need to be addressed to make globalization more equitable. First has to do with strengthening the safety nets globally. Second, address the refugee crisis. Third, deal with the increasing power of the multinational corporations. Fourth, and very important, fix the WTO, which is now not functioning very well. And finally, increase resilience against the recurrence of uh, pandemics, which has two aspects. One of it is a financial aspect, and the other one is a, is a health aspect. How do we do this? I think that it's clear to me that uh, the pandemic and the um, and the um, uh, and the uh, climate change issues show that only through global multilateral agreements can we deal with global issues, and that requires concerted multilateral action. The question then arises. Uh, how do we promote multilateral cooperation when you have geopolitics which are fractured, very seriously fractured as a consequence of the war that we have uh, going on today? And what I'm going to say now is assumes that at some point this war will stop. Wars tend to stop with some agreements. I don't know when. But the alternative of, of, uh, of an Armageddon uh, is not something that I want to contemplate, and there's no point in talking about that issue. Uh, so let's talk about the long-term issues that uh, we were talking about and what we need to do uh, in this context of a fractured geopolitics. And it's not simply the US versus China, although China is very important. It's more like the 1930s, when there were lots of different powers with lots of different uh, access to grind, and in order to deal with uh, with the issues, I think the key questions to me have to do with how to develop public consensus, strong public consensus to deal with the challenges that uh, I was outlining earlier. Um, the public support for climate change or addressing public cha climate change has been actually quite substantial in a number of countries. And uh, I think that the key issues there are the, are the kinds of issues that uh, Alessio was talking about earlier, and I like his book about how he deals with those issues. Um, but we need to extend the issues to beyond the climate change, and we have to deal with poverty education, which has fallen off uh, the agenda of practically everybody. And we need to have public campaigns to inform and promote uh, global action on these issues, as was done earlier in the 21st century, uh, addressing the MDGs, the Multilateral Development Goals. Um, now, the geopolitics are probably not going to permit truly multilateral action uh, in the sense of having global agreements which every, where everybody participates. And there are various alternative scenarios we can talk about how this is going to evolve. But uh, what I think uh, is, in the, is in the cards is what, what in the WTO they call plurilateral agreements, which is agreements that involve a vast number of countries, but not the totality of the organization. And this is very similar to the agreement that uh, was reached in the OECD and it was then uh, extended to other countries, which has to do with the uh, imposing uh, minimum taxes, uh, a minimum tax rate on the multinational corporations. This was something that was developed in the OECD and then it's, it was spread to a number of countries. Uh, sadly, the originator of this idea in the United States hasn't actually passed the legislation which would do that. Um, on trade and finance, uh, Russia is not relevant, uh, but China is. And in the short term, we need very much this collaboration to deal with the debt crisis of the developing countries, to fix the debt as well as fix the WTO. 
uh, on these issues, there are many details uh, that I have in the book and in the paper. Uh, you're welcome, we can discuss them in detail if, if you like it. Uh, finally, I would like to conclude by talking about uh, uh, democracy and, and uh, the, uh, what, I would, what Alessio talks, uh, calls uh, liberal democracies of, the, of Europe. I call it liberalism in my book, it's the same thing. Um, the democratic processes are under pressure in the United States, in Europe, and elsewhere. Democracies need to strengthen their own institutions. These institutions are under pressure, both in the United States and in the EU. Authoritarian regimes tend to underestimate the willingness of democracies to find for their principles. And the democracies have coalesced to defend, to defend Ukraine. But, and here I will finish by quoting from the last sentence of my book. Democracies need to also sacrifice for the good of the global commons, including to act to promote global social and environmental justice. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. All right, uh, I will uh, give the floor to our second speaker, uh, Antigoni Liberaki. Antigoni, over to you. Thank you, Vanos. <clears throat> Thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and share some views with you. Uh, since the turn of the millennium, discussions with the same topic, what future for globalization, have been repeated numerous times in varying contexts. The topic has always been relevant and interesting. It's uh, the kind of topic that often triggers heated arguments. And it is a good opportunity to air broader ideas regarding the meaning of development, the characteristics of a desirable society, the responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the less fortunate, even grand narratives of uh, competing systems of socioeconomic organization. Uh, the question, do we have too much globalization? Has globalization gone too far? Or the problem is that we have too little globalization? Or what is the meaning of globalization? Or as uh, George Diglitz put it, we need to get right deglobalization. Now, the discussion today is taking place in the shadow of two uh, specific crises, the pandemic on the one hand and the environmental crisis on the other. The former literally crashed the world economy. It sort of shrunk 30% uh, world trade and largely punished the poor more than the rich. In the question, what does the future hold for us? There is wild speculation about the shape of the recovery. Uh, people get uh, into heated discussion uh, about whether the recovery will be U-shaped or V-shaped or W-shaped or K-shaped or even the nightmare scenario of L-shaped. There is very often, more often than should be in my poor opinion, the idea that there is always ultimately the possibility of returning to the pre-pandemic normal. Bearing in mind the environmental uh, challenges, together with the geopolitical upheavals, of course, this does not seem to me to be possible because it's not sustainable and hence it's not desirable. Although many voices are uh, raised against globalization, I think there is little doubt that the two previous waves of globalization enhanced economic integration, boosted productivity and living standards, tripled the size of the world economy, and lifted, what is more important, I think, lifted more than 1.3 billion people out of um, extreme poverty. The flip side was the increase in inequalities, mainly within, but also between countries. From where we stand now, the visible dark clouds seem to be the, the recession and the pandemic, and also the geopolitical upheaval. 
probably even darker cloud is the environment and the action that needs to be taken in order to stop its degradation. It seems to me strange that the environmental aspect is so often conspicuously absent from the list of things that we have to address urgently. And I'm very pleased that this does not apply to Kostas Michalopoulos' uh, uh, work. Now, in view of what the IMF calls a confluence of calamities, there is a lot of discussion about resilience and how to strengthen it, while some uh, people talk in favor of degrowth. The latter is presented as the answer to rising inequalities and um, the stagnation of the middle classes in developed countries. Let me share some preliminary thoughts on both because I find both, both these ideas potentially troubling. Potentially troubling is resilience when it is proposed as a shield um, to protect from, glo from globalization its hazards. Um, because it seems to me it is a problem that it very often leads to uh, deglobalization rhetoric. And um, it presents autarky as, um, as a, as a free lunch, basically, without uh, any visible costs attached. This discussion makes me remember the development strategies of my youth, uh, import substituting industrialization versus export-led growth, um, the need for um, the state to um, take over the strategic uh, sectors of the economy, and provide some guidance. I admit that I trained as a development economist in the 80s, a time when these ideas had lot of, lots of traction. Now transposed to today's world, I find these ideas uh, troubling. And the reason is because resilience can be very easily hijacked by populists and demagogues to mean sheer consolidation of the already well-entrenched uh, domestic interests, sectors and activities that are inward-looking and uncompetitive. Degrowth is always troubling to me, not um, potentially. First, because when I bring to mind the poor people in poor countries, I feel it is a kind of a hubris. It is complacent, it is sanctimonious, and it ignores um, uh, equity and uh, justice um, principles. But even in broader audiences, it does not seem a good idea. Uh, first, because it sort of consolidates the uncompetitive and inward-looking, well-entrenched interests, but also because it provides a good excuse to leave poor people in poor countries to fend for themselves. Honestly, I cannot imagine a desirable future in which there will be less trade and no growth, and at the same time, a more protective and efficient and generous safety net so as not to leave anybody uh, behind. Redistribution is very difficult, even at the best of economic times. Frankly, when the economies shrink, it seems next to impossible to me. What is more, to me, less trade and less um, extroversion, be it uh, economic, political, or cultural, will be the coup de grace for the values of the open society and human rights women's rights, gay rights, uh, refugee rights, human rights, all of them, minority rights, are going to be seen as luxuries. I shall say no more on the growth because we have among us an expert, Mr. Terzi, whose recent book I thoroughly enjoyed. But I'll say some more on trade. To my mind, international trade, and more broadly, the movement of uh, things, people and ideas has played the role of a constant educator, uh, a constant educator supporting open questions, new ideas, innovation. 
in its absence, I cannot think who is going to play that role. So what will the future bring? Some people say that it will bring about a more bipolar world divided along spheres of influence with one US centric and another China centric bloc. This is a very pessimistic scenario because um, it has been estimated that such a distinction, a dichotomy, would have serious welfare losses, up to 12% of, of the wealth of the GDP. And these losses will be felt more acutely in poor regions. So it's going to produce a, 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 an inverse redistribution. So um, the the it seems to me that um, with the array of problems that we're facing, fixing uh, each and every problem um, um, separately is not enough. I think it is important to come up with a new grand narrative, a new big story um, conducive to growth for welfare, but also for defending democracy and peace. When societies no longer expect growth or progress, they are more pliable to populists and undemocratic demagogues. And more importantly, each individual tends to focus on his or her own narrow um, and short-term interest and the common good considerations go to hell. Um, I think that we need a new growth-oriented big story because uh, there is no other way to encompass also the environmental aspects and because uh, the current conjecture um, is reminiscent of previous critical points. So sometimes the discussion is being carried out in the newspapers, let's say, as if we are facing a unique and unprecedented set of dilemmas. And although there is little doubt that we find ourselves in a critical historical moment, with the wisdom of hindsight, it seems that such critical moments of critical decisions are recurrent in history. And they happen in the midpoint of a development long wave when a new set of revolutionary technologies is taking root in production, but the institutional apparatus of the world economy or of the individual uh, countries is not yet in tune with the new uh, rules of the game. So the, the previous critical moment was um, similar to today's was the 1930s recession and the Second World War. This was the deployment of the mass production paradigm. And it was solved in the post-war era when institutions developed to match mass production with mass consumption. And uh, they put in place also a, a safety net that sort of helped uh, people not to fall uh, through the cracks of the system. And this ushered in an unprecedented um, quality of uh, prosperity, which lasted for many decades. Now, in the 1970s, the people who work with techno-economic paradigms and long waves suggest that even from the 1970s, this mass production paradigm had lost, had exhausted its uh, productivity potential, but it was saved in a miraculous way by globalization and the incorporation of China, India, and then um, uh, Eastern Europe into the world economy. And so it was, its uh, demise was postponed, but the world economy has been running on steroids over the past 40 years. And this uh, means that 
we are in for a big rethink of the parameters and of the basic um, principles. Um, after the dot-com bubble, the recession of 2008 and the great um, lockdown of 2020, it seems that the system of mass production, mass consumption and big waste of uh, production and consum consumption is looking uh, at the abyss. The pandemic maybe precipitated something waiting to happen. So the real challenge today is to change direction for a new growth path, away from standardization and high volumes of identical products and services and more dematerialized growth, more um, less wasteful and more innovation intensive. The ICD, as we used to call it in, in the time when I was studying um, at Sussex, uh, the ICT revolution or new technology, digital revolution, whatever you want to call it, can offer us very powerful tools to re refurbish uh, the world system and move away from tangible products to intangible services and from disposable products to more durable, high quality products with a long life, say a hundred years, provided that they are regularly maintained and upgraded and made of recyclable and renewable materials. So the new direction for growth has been called by Carlota Perez, who had tended to be one of my heroes in the 80s and co continues to be. The world has changed 10 times ever since. She calls it smart, green, uh, fair, and global. These are the, the basic ingredients. And we can use the powerful tools at our disposal within the digital technology to overcome both environmental and social problems. But we need to tune the various policy strands to achieve a common, um, a common uh, uh, objective and um, take advantage of uh, synergies. Um, at the bottom line, I think, is that big questions require big narratives. And unless we are able to provide a new big narrative, a new big story, um, nothing else, nothing less will do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Antigone. All right, over to Margarita, Margarita Katsimi. Can you hear me? Very well. Very well, okay. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to start with uh, thanking Manos Matsaganis and uh, uh, George Pagulatos and uh, Elia Met for, for inviting me. Uh, I think that the previous speaker raised some very, very important uh, issues uh, regarding uh, the future of globalization and uh, the questions that Manos raised uh, at the beginning. I read with great interest the paper and in the book of uh, Kostas Michalopoulos describing an agenda of what he calls an equitable reglobalization. Uh, it's true we need future policies aiming uh, at addressing climate change, reducing poverty, especially in low income countries, strengthening the resilience through an efficient social safety net, limiting the power of multinational corporation to avoid uh, taxation and exercise anti-competitive uh, practices. And finally, we need to re-establish an effective multilateral trading system. All these are uh, the, the different components of this reglobalization agenda that uh, Michalopoulos suggests, and uh, I think they are, uh, I, I, I can endorse uh, all of them. Uh, global changes are significant and increasing. Uh, the geopolitical risk is high, as uh, we all uh, uh, experience in the recent uh, years. Uh, this exposes, of course, the weaknesses of the current globalized environment. And at the same time, it shifts political equilibrium further away, I'm afraid, 
from international collab collaboration. Still, uh, many global challenges, although equilibrium, as I will, I will say a few more things later on, shifts from this uh, concept of international cooperation. At the same time, many global challenges like uh, climate change or pandemics are what economists call a public good. Michalopoulos also mentioned that. This implies that uh, once solved these problems, then everyone benefits which means that countries have an incentive to act as free riders uh, and enjoy the benefits without bearing the cost. Especially these problems are the problems that in order to be solved efficiently, they need to be addressed through cooperative actions. Uh, at the same time, only a collaborative global multilateral approach can be addressed uh, these future challenges together with improving income inequality. So basically, we want to uh, have a safer uh, environment uh, that will uh, guarantee economic efficiency and, uh, and global equality. In order not to repeat what the previous speakers already mentioned, I would like to talk mainly about the empirical fact that political equilibrium in the developed countries uh, shifts gradually away from pro-globalization uh, agenda. This shift will unavoidably affect the collaborative approach followed as well as the future of re-globalization. My reading of the book of, of Michalopoulos coincided in the book and, and, the, and the paper coincided with Italian elections. So against this background, my thoughts were mainly focused on issues, issues that were uh, mentioned in the book and especially in chapter 11 that is entitled Rising Populism and Anti-Globalization. Uh, a common characteristic of the radical uh, right parties that have increasingly won vote shares uh, in OECD countries is that their political platform expresses what we call economic nationalism. What does this mean? This implies mainly protectionist measures on international trade, as well as opposition to supranational institutions like the European Union, WTO, etc. Clearly, globalization is a process that creates winners and losers. Even if it is a process that leads to aggregate welfare gains, it can bring painful and long lasting adjustment costs. And this is a process that can either lead to voters demanding a, a reduction in the resulting inequality through redistribution of growth gains and compensation of the losers. This is mainly what happened in the post-war period, or it can lead to voters demanding the reverse of the process of globalization. This is something that we uh, see more uh, in the last uh, decade in, in the political <coughs> environment. So, do political developments in the last decade signal that we have moved from the first uh, scenario to the second? As I said, post-war trade liberalization and multilateralism uh, were coupled with policies aimed at promoting domestic economic growth while at the same time having stabilization policies in order to avoid shocks and in order to minimize the social cost of, of the shocks. During that period, and for several decades, the EU witnessed the process of deep economic integration. It moved to the creation of the Eurozone and was at the international level an active driver of globalization. Quoting Michalopoulos, the essence of capitalism is creative destruction. With no doubt, in the last decades, this constra constructive discussion progress uh, resulting from technological change was accompanied with several economic shocks that played, I think, a significant part in this political shift towards what I defined before as economic nationalism. We have the rise in China, the financial and the sovereign debt crisis, in the Great Recession, the uh, immigration wave uh, from Syria, the pandemic, the Ukraine war, and, and the energy crisis. So as a result, we witnessed a slowdown of both trade and growth, and there was an increase in the intra-country inequality of income in, in most countries. At the same time, economic power, there was change in economic power that shifted away from the US and Europe to China and Asia. 
and in the developed economies, political developments within many countries brought in power governments less willing to follow a collaborative global multilateral approach. So the fact that voters' preference towards anti-globalization parties strengthened implies that governments failed at addressing the distributional consequences of globalization. This is something that we read extensively even uh, during the Brexit period that, or, or during, uh, after Trump was elected in the US. So the gains of the winners of globalization do not seem to translate into additional public resources that would be sufficient to finance a strong welfare state and to compensate the losers of the process. To an important extent, this is also due to the process of the globalization itself, since the liberalization of uh, factor markets like the capital market, Michalopoulos also mentioned that, made it increasingly difficult for national government to, rise, to raise tax revenues from top earners and multinational uh, companies that exploit, find differences uh, and exploit these differences in national tax regimes and this results to tax avoidance and uh, decreases both the national and the global welfare from, from globalization. In fact, empirical evidence for a large sample of 65 countries show that in the period between 1994 and 2007, first, there has been a globalization-induced rise in labor income tax burden of the middle class, while the top 1% of workers and employees witnessed a reduction. And secondly, there has been a decline in corporate taxes and an increase in profit shifting practices to tax havens. So all this provides, a, unfortunately, a fertile ground for the electoral success of parties promising protectionism combined with pride, because protectionism may not be uh, by itself may not be so appealing, but this combined with pride for the national way of living and self-sufficiency. So what I would like to do is to show you some, I mean, uh, motivated from, from, the, from this uh, chapter of, of, of the book of Michalopoulos, I had a look at a data set called Manifesto. The, I, I don't know whether you're aware of the Manifesto a project. This is, uh, provides a database with parties' policy positions and these are derived from the party's electoral manifestos. It's very extensive. It covers about 1,000 parties uh, uh, from 1945 until today in over 50 countries in five continents. These countries are most, mostly OECD democracies and Central and Eastern European. One, let me share my screen. To, okay. Okay. Right. So one of the aspects analyzed um, by manifesto is party's position in favor of what is called the national way of life. And this may include support of established national ideas, appeals to patriotism, to nationalism, uh, general appeals to pride of citizenship, etc. Another issue analyzed by the same database is the party's position, whether a party is against what they call internationalism. And this includes uh, negative references to international cooperation and several other issues. And another uh, third issue that I found relevant is whether the party is strongly in favor of protectionism. That is whether its pre-electoral agenda includes favorable mentions of uh, extending or maintaining the protection of the internal market and uh, on measures that include tariffs, quota restrictions, etc. So this first graph that I show you, basically on the left, uh, on the vertical axis, it depicts the anti-globalization stance of the party. So how important uh, this uh, agenda anti-globalization agenda is for, for the manifesto of the party. And on the right-hand side, uh, I depict the vote share of the party. So this is scatter graph. So a general, this is like 
all countries together, all parties together, all peers together. So it's like all observations, basically. So what and the picture that emerges, which is uh, not a very bad picture necessarily, is that uh, in general, other globalization parties have low vote shares. We can see that uh, we can see that there is a negative relationship. There are some outliers. I don't know if you can see my just as epilogistic. Wait. This here is Hungary. It's like it's an outlier. But in general, we see that parties that have a high anti-globalization and agenda have below 10% of vote shares in, in, the specific, in the specific election. However, in each election period, maybe in one country, more than one party uh, competes that has an anti-globalization agenda, which means that aggregating the shares across countries may give us a sort of different picture. So in the next graph, I, uh, what I did is that I picked up for each EU country, the parties that heavily use the idea of a national way of living in their agenda. So in its uh, electoral period, in each country, as I said before, we may have more than one party. So I basically aggregated the vote shares of all parties that they have a very strong, that their agenda uh, relies heavily on this national way of living. So uh, the other thing that I want to explain is that given that each observation corresponds to one country in one electoral period, obviously the number of elections throughout this period from the 60s onward uh, were, ha have not decreased. So here we have as many elections as, as in that period. But the fact that we don't have more observation here implies that there were no parties with a strong uh, pro-national way of living and agenda in these periods, or they were more scarce, these parts. So basically, we, there are two conclusions that we can draw from this picture. First, that after 2000, we have more parties that base their electoral campaign on nationalistic arguments. We see more, more dots here, whereas here uh, they're scarce, here they're more frequent. And the next uh, conclusion that we can draw is that the vote share, the aggregate vote share of this increases. So if we add up the parties per country and per election, this, uh, this shows an, an upward trend. So despite, and in fact, the reason why I present this graph for the EU is that we have a process of deepening of European integration in, in the European Union. And we can see that after 2000, uh, despite the fact that this process uh, may continue, I don't know whether it has deepened after 2000, uh, we have the debt crisis, we have the, the, the financial crisis, and throughout this period, we see that uh, this so-called deepening has been accompanied with the rise in uh, uh, in parties that favor a national uh, way of living. So, wait, am I back? Sorry. Uh, okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, so as already discussed, part of the reason for this political shift that uh, I actually uh, depicted some evidence for this is that countries have been exposed to stronger trade shocks such as the rise of China, and these shocks hit mainly low wage and low skilled workers and have generated persistent employment and uh, income loss uh, that are concentrated basically in the import competed, uh, competed regions. So there is an extended literature that indicates that as economic theory predicts, stronger exposure to Chinese competition basically caused displacement of domestic manufacturing and induced lower employment and lower wages at the level of local labor markets. 
And this has been depicted, as I said, by the empirical literature, both for, for the United States and the, the EU countries. Uh, grew from less 1% to about 7%. And uh, with an acceleration of this uh, rise following China's uh, accession to the WTO in 2001. So as Michalopoulos points out, if voters perceive that manufacturing jobs are created in China and Mexico and destroyed in the US or the UK, then there is a political economy problem. In fact, this we show some, some, some empirical uh, evidence for this problem. And the problem becomes even bigger if it appears, as in the case of China, that state-owned enterprises continue to be subsidized despite uh, the, the rules of WTO. And there is another very interesting uh, strand of empirical uh, literature that links this displacement of domestic manufacturing uh, induced from globalization to political support for nationalistic and radical right parties. There is a rich, a rich literature for that. And this literature uses uh, regional data in uh, several countries, including the United States and several European countries. And basically what they find is that stronger exposure to the China shock causes first an increase in support for both nationalist and radical right parties. And second, they saw a general a shift to the right in the electorate. They also find something else that is very interesting, is that the electoral results seem to reflect a community level reaction. This means that voters respond to a worsening and economic condition of their community, even if they are not involved personally, even if they are, let's say, civil servants, and they, there is no risk of losing their job, they respond to, uh, to the situation of the community they live in. So uh, I don't want to steal more time. I, I think it's about time to talk. So concluding, uh, the future of globalization uh, depends crucially in international collaboration. I think this is clear, but international collaboration in turn unavoidably will be affected by the evolution of the vote shares of anti-globalization parties. So policymakers must convince their electorate that the gains from globalization are equitably distributed. This implies radical change in tax policy and strengthening of international cooperation to tackle uh, low capital taxes and tax avoidance of multinational cooperation. So the OECD tax, uh, capital tax, could be a first step uh, towards this process. So pandemic and the Ukrainian war have exposed weaknesses of globalization, such as dependence on global value chains and, and energy supplies. Voters blame globalization for the rise in energy prices and supply side shortages. Uh, we experience a new geopolitical environment and it's very difficult to predict how the world will look at, like in a few years. For sure, uh, it will differ significantly from 30 years ago in several aspects. For example, energy security will be increasingly important. On the other hand, international cooperation is absolutely necessary to solve issues such as the adaption to climate change. According to an optimistic scenario, trying to be optimistic, optimistic, if this need is perceived by the voters, we can hope that this may limit the power of anti-globalization parties in order to shift the political equilibrium more towards international cooperation. As Adigoni Liberaki uh, said, a big narrative is required. Thank you so much, Margarita. <clears throat> All right, I'll uh, give the floor uh, straight away to Alessio Terzi. Uh, he's our last but not least speaker, of course. Alessio, over to you. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Manos, for, for the invitation. Thanks uh, to um, Elia Mep for, for having me. Uh, among uh, this uh, Greek uh, crowd, I, I feel uh, even more honored to be the the, the only uh, foreigner who made the cut, uh, and I and uh, I'm, I feel very much at home. Nonetheless, uh, I, I counted my book was already mentioned three times uh, in uh, half an hour, so I uh, or in one hour, so I'm um, 
I feel very much at home. Um, I and I thank uh, Costas for for this opportunity to share some thoughts about um, the topics of his book. I'm not gonna comment on the on the specifics, but rather on the overarching theme. And I try to be brief um, in my remarks, also to to allow for potential replies or or any questions uh, from the audience. Um, my feeling, and I think it's something that emerged from, uh, from, from the brief presentation that uh, Constantine gave at the beginning, um, what emerges is, uh, is, a, is a, let's say, um, f fresh optimism uh, that, is, that is very much welcome because uh, if, you, if you spend your day reading the news, uh, there is very uh, little of that. And I welcome that, and I say that I welcome that because I'm an optimist uh, as well, and uh, and I'm not saying uh, um, I am uh, in a way. Costas himself defines uh, self defines himself as an optimist, and uh, even characterizes this. And I'm reading from uh, from the paper uh, from the Eliamet paper that Manos mentioned at the beginning, where where he says I'm an I'm also an optimist in the way Jane uh, Goodall uh, explains it. Um, hope enables us to keep going in the face of adversity. Uh, it is what we desire to happen. But we must be prepared to work hard uh, to make it so. Now, even though I am, uh, I, we share this uh, this optimism. I will uh, disagree with with much of the of the reading of uh, of, of globalization and what is about uh, to happen. And in a way. The reason to reconcile the fact that I have a great appreciation for a smart book by a, a consummate uh, policy economist and the fact that I disagree goes back to a quote by Antonio Gramsci. Uh, it is not the quote that to a certain extent Costas uh, hinted to at the beginning, which was the one on the, on the fact that when the old order collapses and a new one hasn't emerged yet, so this is when uh, monsters arise. Uh, uh, but it is rather another quote, uh, and it is the quote that we should pursue uh, pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will. And uh, my, while I will focus, let's say, on the, on the pessimism of the intellect, I suspect uh, Costas uh, focuses on the optimism of the will, uh, which in a sense means what we would like to happen. It goes in line with, with, uh, with statements like, uh, we would need we need greater global cooperation, or you know my focus is on climate change, and therefore statements like uh, uh, climate change is a global problem, therefore it requires a global solution. The fact that it requires it doesn't mean that we will get one. Uh, and so that is my per first and perhaps overarching point, which is that the forces uh, that we are observing are pushing in the exact opposite direction. And uh, this is something that uh, uh, Margarita already hinted to in her uh, brief uh, intervention. Uh, and I, you know, I, I could come up with a list of several items. There's the obvious uh, US-China uh, uh, rivalry. And there, you know, even for the, for the more optimists, and, and Costas mentioned this as well, the hope was to sort of disentangle the rivalry that is inevitable to us extent from the things that we should continue cooperating on. This has been the approach of the Biden administration at the very beginning to say, you know, we are uh, entering into a, a regime of, uh, of, uh, of rivalry with China, but we're going to keep climate change aside and we continue cooperating on climate change. And this is evidently something that is not happening. Uh, and to a certain extent, for experts of international relations, of diplomacy, this shouldn't come as a surprise. You bargain on multiple fronts. It's very hard to just put something in a silo, uh, keep cooperation going on that, and, in, and then instead uh, enter into tough rivalry on, uh, on all other fronts. Um, another element that is closer to my heart and perhaps closer to my expertise is the effects of climate change. This is something that I mentioned in my book. Uh, but effectively, as climate change starts showing its, uh, its impact, uh, it will um, it will increase tensions uh, between countries. It will affect all countries, uh, but some more 
than others, uh, think of the of a third of Pakistan being underwater. Uh, and of course, you know, at the same time, also the US was experiencing extreme weather events. Also, Italy was experiencing extreme weather events, but the, the proportions are, uh, are off the charts uh, for a variety of reasons. And the result will be, especially when taking into account that many of these countries contribute to the least to the problem of climate change, that the tension between uh, rich and poor countries will increase. Um, COVID gets mentioned, uh, the, the Ukraine war uh, couldn't be mentioned, but COVID gets mentioned. And I often hear, uh, I think this is the case here, but it is a more generalized problem to my mind that, uh, you know, it is often framed, uh, COVID is often framed as uh, something where we've learned lessons, uh, which might be the case, but I feel that everybody draws different lessons from what we've learned. And my impression is that the way COVID played out is exactly the way that we're going to see uh, climate change playing out again and again. And the reason being that it was a shock. Um, it was a shock that you know, affected all countries, some countries more than others. Um, again, something that climate change has uh, in common. Uh, in order to buffer the shock, the, the countries that have more resources, have more technology, have access to vaccines in this case, or can develop in the past, will use all their resources to do that. Uh, those that don't, don't, can't. And, uh, and we were not, we did not see a the proportionate, uh, let's say, transfer of resources from, from richer countries to poorer countries, at least until the emergency was there. And I suspect that this is the pattern that we're going to see uh, recursively. And this, again, will drive up tensions between rich and poor countries, which is something that we're seeing, by the way, in the aftermath of COVID, where there is a lot of resentment that the vaccines were not shared timely enough, or that there wasn't a waiver for, for the patents, and so on. Uh, and within this context, uh, the, the, the discussion is revolving a lot around these loss and damage type of facilities and large structures whereby rich countries would, would pay out for the losses of poorer nations, this is not going to happen on the scale that the problem represents. And this is something that, uh, so uh, I, I want to be clear that, I, that on this point we agree in the sense that we're talking about, you know, transfers of 100 billion, which is peanuts uh, when compared to the, the scale of the problem for the years to come. Uh, linking to what uh, was Kostas was mentioning in his intervention, that democracies uh, should sacrifice for the greater good. There is no scenario where democracy will sacrifice for the greater good. As a matter of fact, individual nation, democracy alone, and I think it is a framing that does not help uh, because uh, acts of self-flagellation have never been observed. Uh, to a large, to such a large scale as the one that would be needed throughout this. Um, in this respect, uh, there is a mention that gets made to the G20 and the lessons of the pandemic of what we've learned over the past uh, few years and the G20 seen as a forum where coordination could take place at the national level. I don't see that happening at all. Uh, as I said, uh, there's a widening gap in rich countries and poor countries in the G20 and the composition, the very composition of the G20 with Russia in it implies that that is a forum where progress will be extremely limited when it manages to meet. So that is the state of at which coordination in the G20 is happening. And perhaps to zoom out, I suspect that the, the different reading that we give uh, between Costas and myself is, uh, is due to the fact that in a, to a certain extent, I am going back on my, or my reading of, uh, of history uh, or the philosophy of history to a certain extent is perhaps Hegelian. Um, so going back to Friedrich Hegel and his idea of a, of a zeitgeist or a geist of history. Uh, and, and therefore this idea that history is not made by individual leaders that are just driven by an agenda, but are rather leaders that emerge as a result of factors that are at play in the world. And I think that the factors that are at play in the world are pushing a cutting off uh, of less globalization or less cooperation on many of these, uh, 
of these fronts, and therefore the line between the optimism of the will and utopian thinking is uh, extremely thin at times. The question to me um, is, uh, we get what we get, so we get the situation we're in right now, and how we do it. And, and to a certain extent, my form of optimism uh, emerges from the fact that I believe that it is possible to fight against climate change, even in a fragmented scenario, even one in which we are not going to get the first best solutions, which are the ones that cost us hints to. I will not say how that is possible for those who haven't read the book yet, uh, it is uh, all mentioned uh, in there. And perhaps uh, as a concluding remark, um, I was thinking back uh, as, as you were speaking to a very famous, uh, very famous book. The book is, uh, I'm sure you, you're aware of it, which is The Great uh, Illusion by Norman Angel, a book that came out in 1909. And it is a book, a fundamental book in international relations. It gets often mentioned because it is a book where Angel was saying effectively, and I'm, I'm, I'm not doing justice to the book, but in two words, what he was saying is, you know, we're living in an era that of such great economic uh, uh, interaction where countries have become so closely intertwined economically that war is unthinkable. And of course, it is a book where, whereby after five years, we entered uh, World War I. World entered World War I. And so for some time, this book was seen as, you know, it was made fun of, as if a scholar hadn't understood anything. And I think there is a better reading of it, but more recent, more rapid, which is to say, actually, Engel had realized exactly what was happening. And the reason why he wrote this book was precisely to try and contrast some of the, of the pushes or the, or the negative uh, um, pushes of history. And so although it has been read as a book that is not in tune, was not in tune, or the, the quintessential example of a book that was not in tune with its life, uh, it was actually an author that had realized challenges and was trying to uh, push a little bit away. And I think that Costa's book, uh, I'm sure that he's very well aware of the challenges that I have mentioned. I don't think he's discovered anything from my brief uh, intervention. But rather, my understanding is that he's very aware of well, very well aware of them, and therefore he wrote a book that gives us an optimism of the will as to what should happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alessio. Well, we have now concluded the first round of interventions. We have another twenty minutes, perhaps or so. Uh, so there is time uh, for a second round. Uh, I'd like to raise a couple of questions. Uh, and uh, of course, you are free to comment uh, on each other's uh, interventions. Well, my first point, actually, both points have been uh, mentioned in in passing by uh, by some uh, or at least one uh, speaker. My first question is about the need to uh, promote international cooperation in order to deal with uh, climate change, a goal that cannot be achieved by cooperation within the West alone, uh, and therefore it needs uh, the cooperation of, of at least China and India, possibly other countries too. So I'd like to ask our panelists what they think the chance of that happening uh, soon may be, and perhaps more interestingly, what the West needs to be for that chance to improve? That's my first question. The second question concerns the role of Europe. Uh, do, do, the, Europe has always been for free trade and open markets, but how do you see that role changing in the light of recent developments and the recent advance of uh, radical right-wing populists, notably in Sweden and, and of course in Italy. So I wonder, is the EU poised to become more protectionist than has historically been the case? Um, we see a revival of interest in so-called strategic autonomy on the part of the commission and also uh, national governments. 
Is it an indication that we're going to see shorter global value chains, less offshoring, more reshoring, nearshoring, friendshoring, and so on? I'm sure our panelists have interesting things to say on this. So I'd like to invite, let's start with Costas again. Um, you don't need to comment on my questions. You're very welcome to, of course, but you can also say whatever else you like in five minutes. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me start with your uh, last uh, comment first. Uh, I, you know, the, the, the European collaboration is very important on the climate side. And uh, as you know, and I'm sure Alessio knows, there is now a discussion in, in, the, in the EU about uh, the way to move forward on uh, putting in uh, a carbon border adjustment mechanism. Um, which is, uh, you can't have a, a carbon pricing um, uh, uh, action individually uh, because it's going to get uh, you're going to get you into trouble with the existing WTO proposals, the, uh, the WTO measures. So you really need to have a common approach to this uh, globally, and the uh, the union is actually moving forward first in some ways in trying to put together something on the subject. Uh, so uh, yes, in fact, action is possible. Uh, and I think action, and, and I hope that it uh, will be resolved soon because they're now talking with the Commission, is talking to the Parliament, and there's a trilateral discussion. Um, two other points. Uh, I think, I, you know, I'm delighted to be called uh, an optimist of the will. Uh, yeah. In the absence of will, uh, nothing happens. Uh, so, therefore, I'm not uh, necessarily uh, forecasting the future that uh, it will happen. But unless something uh, is laid out as uh, you know, people start doing something, one of the things that you have to do is to try to promote uh, the kinds of understanding of what's happening in the in the global uh, situation uh, locally. And you know, in democracies, uh, this thing is not very easy. I think uh, Margarita was quite correct in saying that you know we're going in a different direction. Uh, but uh, let's see, uh, if we have a discussion such as this, uh, perhaps uh, people will listen to it and will understand the problems of, uh, of uh, creating a, a, an autarchic uh, EU. An autarchic EU is not too bad, actually, it's a big, it's a big country, it's a big uh, market. But if you try to, uh, to do this uh, globally, then you're going to go into, a, into a, an absolutely uh, disaster situation. Uh, I had, uh, I have a, a fair, uh, I mean, I, I have a very interesting understanding about what Antigone said about uh, the evolution of history and how the institutions have not really been, uh, been, uh, 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 have not adjusted sufficiently to the, to the growth of technological change. It's an interesting thought. Uh, we were talking about it in this, that this, that the globalization did it extended the light of the of, uh, of things uh, beyond the 70s. Uh, it's an interesting thought. I, I'd like to look into that uh, and I'd like to have a reference for the book that you were talking about. Thank you. Thank you, Costas. Antigone? Well, I'll try to address your first question um, regarding climate change and the possibility of international cooperation. I have to say from the outset that because climate change is not um, an asteroid that is going to hit the earth, but it's the outcome of the very essence of our development paradigm, not only the mass production one, but starting from the um, industrial revolution, but definitely uh, accelerated uh, uh, very much during the, the mass production, mass consumption, uh, huge waste um, era. Uh, it's not something that um, the negative, the fear and negative um, uh, narrative does not um, um, does not um, um, mobilize people and governments to do the right thing. I think it has to be repackaged in a more positive frame that we have uh, 
uh, enjoyed um, in a completely um, uh, without any second thought the the goods of uh, low energy and uh, high waste uh, civilization in order to live better we need to rethink how we produce how we consume how we distribute because you're going to be uh, much happier with that not because we're afraid that something terrible uh, a curse will fall on us and i think that this is why we need grand narratives because we need to um, make it a question of lifestyle and there are rising lifestyles very much more pro uh, cycling pro walking pro uh, not throwing away things that could very well continue to to to, to be operable and also it is important to bring business into it in order to, to, to open up investment opportunities in the transition to a greener, fairer, more global and smarter world. So this is why I'm trying to, it's, sometimes I feel that I speak a different language. Maybe the fact that I'm not a native speaker aggravates the issue, but it's not like we need to repent in the theology a way that we destroyed nature but life will be so much more interesting for everyone if we do it the green smart fair global way and part of the problem with the rhetoric regarding climate change is this uh, negative and punishing and almost theological now as regards the protectionist EU in terms of uh, migration the eu on the one hand um, laments the fact that they have a demographic issue whatever this might mean and on the other hand it kind of stops uh, young people full of uh, how, how shall i say incentives to work and make it from entering europe so it's very easy to to do the wrong thing and I think we are very well placed to continue doing it. <laughs> thank you, Antigone. Margarita. Uh, thank you. Yes, I would like to, to complement a little bit what uh, Antigone said on, on climate change uh, and all this issue of how one should rethink the benefits of uh, being environmental friendly and sort of sell this, uh, this, uh, uh, this green change in a different way. And I want to cover this by saying that sometimes, you know, climate, I, I perceive climate change to have something similar to public debt in the sense that they both, it's like you sort of, it's like a, 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 you shift the cost to the future generation, the same way you do that, like with public debt, Greece, you spend today and the cost will be borne by the next generation. Something similar happens with climate change. We produce with, in a cheaper way today and this cost will be borne by, by future generation. And for me, uh, this sort of link comes to my, my mind when I think about uh, the political agenda and the discussions that occur in pre-electoral periods. Because I remember very well, uh, just, I don't know, a very short period before the Greek public debt crisis, uh, the mentioning of public debt and whether, you know, and the, the rise in deficit as being something that is not desirable was completely absent from the political discussion. No one was really talking about that. In a similar way that in countries like with, with, with some exceptions, of, of course, uh, the political discussion in favor of uh, sustainable policies is not something that is very popular in the pre-electoral agendas. And because it's something that uh, concerns basically the future. The voters start caring about it when the, you know, the forest next to their house probably you know, is burned from a fire. But as long as this is something that doesn't really affect their everyday of life, I think they don't really punish uh, parties that promote policies against the environment. We don't really see that so often in the same way that we didn't see in, in, in countries that were affected by the debt crisis, voters to punish 
the governments from, from increasing deficit. This is a sort of similarity uh, that I see sometimes. And therefore, I agree that the narrative should change and that people should really perceive uh, the like, you know, the, the new way of living as something that is desirable. So they should really, the, the climate crisis should be something that affects their, their, their way of, uh, the way they live today. And it's not something that they are afraid of uh, in the future, because I think that at least some countries, this doesn't really work uh, with voters. Now, regarding uh, the EU, well, it's difficult. I mean, it's a big discussion, obviously, but my guess would be that EU will become more integrated. This is what I think. And, uh, but probably at the same time, more self-sufficient. Uh, we already saw with the, uh, with the pandemic, we saw uh, some sort of fiscal union mechanisms to be established. So these sort of mechanisms, I think that the electoral would slowly perceive that there is a safety net at the EU level that could be stronger than uh, their national safety net. At least the majority of voters, I think, should perceive that. And this would be a pro-EU. This will sort of uh, cultivate a pro-EU feeling. But on the other hand, I think that depends on how the geopolitical environment will, uh, will play, that there will be uh, some uh, tendency for the EU to become more self-sufficient, at least uh, as far as, I don't know, energy supplies are concerned, uh, et cetera. Thank you, Margarita. Alessio. Um, so to your first point on on in, on the so to elaborate on international cooperation, I cannot um, hear him. Can you can you speak up a little bit? Can you hear me now? Hmm. Um, to the point of the international cooperation, like the economic thing. You can't hear me. I'm afraid we are. Looking When you look to the right, you are more, um, it is easier to hear. When you turn your head to the right, your, your voice is uh, better. Like this. <laughs> to, to my right or your right? <laughs> Go like this. Yeah, like there. This. Okay. Um, so, my, my thoughts on, on national. Yeah. I, I don't know why you can't hear me anymore now. We That's can't. better. You are left leaning. I am. Uh, I don't. <laughs> I, I don't know because I didn't change microphone. I can try to speak louder if you want. Um, but uh, no, what I have in mind when I think of uh, of international cooperation on on climate change is that you know the the typical one element on which attention is drawn is things like you know an international carbon tax something of this sort and uh, and you know there are the example the typical proposals by the imf uh, of things like uh, how to build a, 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 an international uh, price for carbon and my impression is that this type of thinking fails to realize that the, the degree of economic integration or the degree of economic, um, let's say, planning and cooperation on planning that this would require is huge uh, because of the transformation that the green transition will imply on an economy, the speed at which you do that, and therefore the, the level of the price uh, is, uh, huge and uh, and it would require a degree of, uh, of of shared decision making that again is unprecedented and uh, and i don't think that there is enough alignment at the international level i don't think there is a G, at the g20 level on these things and what i wonder is uh, where are we going to see this i think that the national level is likely. So we can see prices being set at the national level. Uh, at the EU level is likely we're seeing that there is a, an ETS. So there is a carbon price 
at the EU level. And then the question that to me is interesting is, are we going to see it at a higher level, maybe at the G7? And it is something that we've heard of, for example, of a carbon border tax, Costas was mentioning it, that happens at the G7 level rather than the EU level alone. Um, maybe, I don't know. It is hard for me to see it in the sense that, again, you know, even in the G7, that it's countries that are culturally closer, similar level of development, uh, have pledged to act uh, rapidly on climate change, at least uh, in the last two years. I don't know if, if there is enough uh, political agreement on that. And we see the US doesn't even have a carbon price of its own at the federal level. So if they cannot figure it out on their own at the national level, it's hard for me to see it happening at the, um, at the, G, at the G7 um, level. And I will stop there. Thank you, Alessio. Right, it is now on my clock almost 6.30 here in Athens, so I will bring today's webinar to a close. Let me thank once more our four panelists for making our webinar so lively and thoughtful, and also for keeping the time so impeccably, which is highly unusual, I must say. Let me also thank you listeners for being with us today. I hope you have all found the webinar as fascinating as I have. From all of us at the Hellenic Foundation for European and Foreign Policy, Elia Mep, goodbye for now, and we look forward to seeing you in another of our webinars soon.